Welcome to our current affairs edition and today on our top stories we are focusing on smart water of for agriculture which is an SNV innovation fund that is helping Kenyan farmers to increase their production. We also look at tobacco how can we minimize the use of tobacco and how we can help the tobacco farmers find alternative methods by looking in ways to which we can help in reducing tobacco smoking in Kenya. Welcome. The Kenya Smart Water for Agriculture is a four-year, six million euro program funded by the Kingdom of Netherlands Embassy in Nairobi as part of food security and private sector agenda. Smart Water for Agriculture aims to increase the food security by optimizing water availability use and efficiency by small and medium enterprise farmers and businesses. Ultimately, the program's goal is to contribute to increase water productivity in agriculture and increased income and food security through the development of market-driven, climate-resilient, dynamic, and sustainable smart water solutions. The program promotes farmer-led, market-based, innovative water solutions integrated with holistic value chains options, both products and services, which save water and energy for sustainable resource use, but also reduce labor and inputs mitigate weather-related risks, and stimulate attractive off-season production opportunities. The target of this project is, as Lloyd said, already said, is to increase water productivity by 20% for 20,000, as we call them, small and medium entrepreneurial farmers, of which at least 50% are uh, women. And they need to have secured water access for production uh, and become more resilient to climate change. Uh, that is the objective of the project and that's the target we have to uh, achieve. To achieve this, we have next to uh, and the, the, the TA which we are delivering as a, as a consortium, we have also an investment fund and an innovation fund. And this is, as I said, to co-leverage other funding and to co-leverage uh, business cases from companies. So that we need, as a project, at least 10 companies uh, who are ready to invest in the smart water solution sector in Kenya. And that's the minimum. And our objective is also to create financial access to 12,500 farmers. And as I told you just, that is what we are doing with banks uh, uh, and the microfinance institute. So the, the project will con uh, increase to uh, water productivity in agriculture, increased income and food security uh, through the development of a dynamic and a sustainable smart water solution sector in Kenya. And we will work mostly with small and medium entrepreneurial farmers. So there has to be a kind of investment, uh, a readiness from farmers to invest in, in those smart water uh, solutions. Um, it will be farmer-led, it will be market-based, uh, and it will be uh, women empowering. These are really the guiding principles uh, for promoting smart water uh, for agriculture in the whole entire value chain. It's not that we're looking at one small part of the value chain. We want really to set from the finance side, the market side, to the farmer. So within this uh, Smart Water for Agriculture Consortium, the Dutch partners will offer the best international practices and to contribute to the solutions in the Kenyan context. And we do that with our Kenyan partners and who are mostly here uh, in this room and, uh, and the counties. And of course, the National Irrigation Board, the Ministry of Agriculture, the private sector, the finance institutes. Uh, 1.3 million hectares that can be irrigated. Only the available amount of water from the traditional sources, the rivers and the groundwater, uh, the dams that you're planning to put up, we can only do 765,000 uh, hectares. That is 59% uh, uh, coverage. And then in terms of economic water scarcity, the moment of irrigation, we have only covered, as a, as a nation, we've only covered 187,000 hectares out of a possible 7,000, uh, 765,000 uh, hectares. So that is about 25% enrollment. And indeed, um, uh, it is very clear 
when we have these drought situations in this country, that investment in irrigation and water storage indeed has become a priority. Uh, I would wish to confirm that uh, for the next five years, uh, the, our national treasury has put uh, irrigation development and, and uh, irrigation and water storage development as one of the priority programs to be financed uh, from drumming. We are doing a lot of uh, smallholder or community-based uh, manage, community managed irrigation schemes. And uh, we have to date, we have close to 129 projects spread all over the country. We've also distributed greenhouses to uh, 714 uh, uh, women and youth groups. Uh, we've done uh, close to 64 water, water pans in arid areas. And uh, now the current, the current focus is on doing uh, the planned water storage reservoirs. We are doing close to 57 water storage reservoirs. There is an element of technical ad advisory services uh, where National Irrigation Board will be going forward, will be available to anybody who, want, who wants to do irrigation for technical advice, for design. It can be for free, it can be, it can be at cost. And that is one of the key areas we are looking at, at uh, as an institution. I would want to mention to add on top of this is that uh, previously in the past, uh, the past seven years we focused on infrastructure development, so it's as if we are delivering irrigation development service. But now we have a sort of a policy shift where we are looking at a holistic irrigation service delivery. We are looking at infrastructure development where we come in, design, uh, develop infrastructure for our farmers. And then on top of that, we are looking at irrigation management service where we want to, uh, to enter uh, into service level agreements with our farmers and we are able to maintain their systems. Uh, together either for a fee. And then we're also looking at a, a, product, a production, um, production service, which is, which is also very critical because we've noted some of our schemes we developed, um, and I think uh, the SNV team that is doing this project, you witness places where you, there is infrastructure and really it is not being utilized to, uh, for food production as envisaged. The biggest challenge with irrigation, I always tell people, my colleagues, is actually uh, the the market end. When the market end is not clear, irrigation will not really work. One of our, and we call it our golden chicken, is more irrigation scheme. I don't know how many of you know more irrigation scheme. Is the biggest uh, public irrigation scheme we have in the country. It's about 26,000 26, uh, hectares, uh, 26,000 acres. They grow rice, and uh, they've done rice for a long time, since 1966. So they have perfected the art. But the most important thing is that the market for rice is always guaranteed. So they know at the end of the day when they harvest, they'll have, they have people coming in droves to, to buy their produce. And indeed that, that small establishment we have at the beginning of when the season is going through, we have close to five billion changing hands. And then when, the, when they do the harvesting and the value addition, we have close to seven billion of value in terms of 7 billion Kenya shillings of value in terms of uh, the output they get from the farms. A limiting factor, even in the arable areas, uh, the rain patterns have changed, we all know, and we can't, uh, no longer we can uh, depend on them. In addition, 70% uh, of the population makes their living from water consuming agriculture. It is therefore essential for to find innovative and, and sustainable ways of using the available water as efficiently and effectively as possible. And Kenya has a great potential to increase and strengthen the country's food security, to meet the growing demand, to use the available water resources more efficiently and to achieve optimum production and productivity from the land. The smart, smart water for agriculture, we are aiming at saving water and energy and, ser and serving sustainable climate smart use of resources. The project seeks to tap into the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit that Kenya is well known for. By bringing together key players such as financial institutions, small and medium enterprise farmers, water technology <coughs> businesses, research and knowledge institutions, and the government. Focus is lying on identifying and developing smart water solutions for the agricultural sector. 
And as women farmers form such a big stakeholder group, we are aiming at building resilience and empowerment of the women farmers through knowledge, finance, and business opportunities tailored to their needs. In terms of access, we are looking at working with uh, technology providers. So we work together to help them or to facilitate them to come and uh, showcase their technologies to the farmers, train them on how they are used so that the farmers can have access even at the local level of the smart water solution. We are also looking at, like it's two way, so we are looking at creating demand from the farmer side. So the farmer, once the farmer knows about the smart water solution, maybe the technology or a finance product, then if there is demand, we are assured that when the technology providers come along, then they have a market for their product and service the increased produce. And this comes along when the farmer like uses less water to irrigate crops. Like if previously the farmer was using a certain amount of water and he's getting a, a certain produce, then when you use less water, you're able to get more produce for the same amount of water. So that way there is a saving in terms of um, the cost of production goes down. So there is also increased efficiency once there is adoption of smart water solution. And um, efficiency also translates to reduced labor costs and because then you are able to bring like a few laborers on board for the same amount of work. We are also looking at um, energy consumption goes down, especially when you look at if, uh, for instance, if a farmer was using bucket irrigation and then you introduce maybe sprinklers, of course, there's going to be less work involved. We are trying to improve the access of green, like green, uh, uh, improve the access of solar farms, which use green energy, and therefore we have a cleaner environment, not forgetting what is happening now in Kenya, we are no longer using paper bags. So we're also looking at reduced soil degradation and er erosion. And also when we save water, we are assured of uh, enough environmental flow in our rivers. OK, I'm me from uh, Kahenya, and uh, I'm a Rua manager. I'm a Rua manager from uh, Narumoro Rua. And uh, <coughs> I want to present a story that uh, I did out of a need. And um, being a manager, I'm one of the regulators of the river water. And in the process of regulating the river water, I realized how we farmers are suffering because once we do our planning in farming, we are getting challenges in the lack of river flows, especially when it's during the dry season, all our plants are not put into use simply because there's not enough water in the rivers. And therefore, at one time when we were going to the field, I realized how farmers are you know, suffering, learning away when you are doing the regulating and all that. And I came to realize that if you only rely on liver water, we are not actually going to make any business in negation. And therefore, when I went home, I saw the need now to come up with a, another uh, area whereby we can continue doing irrigation without actually relying on the river water. And that is how I decided to come up with a, a greenhouse project that would not rely from the river, but from other sources of water. And the idea was to come up with a greenhouse project and the rooftop was, was now to catch the rainwater, store it in a, in a dam through gravity flow, and then the same water could be, you know, abstracted from the dam, put in a storage tank, and then be diverted back to the greenhouse. And that is a, the plan I, that I originally came up with. And to execute the plan, I needed finances. And when I went to the market and did the research, I realized that buying a greenhouse, or the island greenhouse, was not where, was actually a way of way out of reach of my pocket and the same to my, my, my other neighboring farmers and therefore I did a plan that I can do the greenhouse using the local materials and I went researched to uh, an area whereby I found people doing it I went uh, got the techniques and he gave me all the materials that are required and from there I realized that it's cheaper to do it locally other than to buy directly from the suppliers and from there I started thinking of where I would get my money actually I didn't have much in fact, I had 20% of the finances required, and I had to get uh, into my compound and you know, sell three cows so that I could raise the fat that I required to, to put the greenhouse. It actually worked. I sold the cows, I got the money, 
I went to the forest and procured the the the, the, the planches, the the, the, the the materials, the wooden materials that were required. I also went and procured uh, a second hand uh, polish sheeting from uh, a dealer, and there I came and we started uh, the initial. Uh, planning, we started the initial construction with a supervisor and that was done. The other challenge I got was how will I now do the, the, the dam because it was also expensive to excavate the dam, move the soils and you know get uh, the, the storage for my lane water harvesting. And I realized that in my store I had nine bags of maize. And lucky enough within the village there was drought and everybody was looking for maize and I thought I could trade in maize with reba. And I called men and women and we did that, it really worked and I had my dam done. And the other challenge that came after is how to run my dam. Because I tried to actually store the water from the, from the greenhouse, the electric, and the source were not able to retain the water. Therefore I approached the government ministry in charge of fisheries. There was a program by then that was supporting farmers who, were, who wanted to rear fish and uh, they could be supported with dam liners. I was uh, actually enlisted as one of the people to benefit, and there I got the dam rhino. Then from there, it was you know choice of crop that uh, I would get into because I really needed to get back my money to actually to replace the the cows that I had sold. And I thought that uh, because there was, I was a member of the producer organization that was producing snow peas for Finnish company, a company dealing with you know export of agricultural products. Uh, I thought of engaging first of all in um, in hot kasha because hot kasha is only 60 days and then you start harvesting and within two months you are done and your project is over and you've got the money now to fi fi finance the, the, the other bees that uh, are required to be repaid. And I planted 4 kgs of snow peas and out of those 4 kgs it was quite amazing that I was able to harvest at the end of the season 1,800 kgs, selling them at 150 shillings at the prevailing market price, I was able to get 270,000 shillings. Noting all the costs that uh, were involved to put up the green and, and all that, it was 120,000 and therefore I really made the difference was, you know, profit and I managed to pay all my, my debts and from there I continued to produce with my greenhouse for four years. And therefore my encouragement to farmers is uh, let's not lose hope, even if we are faced with issues of climate change. We are faced with issues of, you know, liver flows actually not uh, the, the, the low flows and uh, getting floods flows and within a very short time we have no water in the rivers. We have sources of water that are far from the rivers. We have the, the rains, we can collect all that. We have underground water and if we only diversify ourselves, we shall do climate smart agriculture and do smart agriculture actually and earn a lot and we will not continue to suffer as we are. Thanks a lot. Well, moving on from smart water agriculture, tobacco is the leading cause of preventable morbidity and mortality globally. With nearly 6 million deaths annually attributed to tobacco use and exposure to tobacco smoke, recent surveys have estimated that the country has 2.5 million adult tobacco users and 14% of Kenyans are exposed to secondhand smoke at home. The deaths due to tobacco use in the country have been steadily increasing, hence the need to establish tobacco control measures such as offering a dependence treatment and a cessation service. The most effective tool uh, and I'll show it even in form of a diagram, the most effective tool to reduce tobacco consumption is uh, taxation. Uh, that is number, number, number one uh, key highlight of my presentation. Number two is that um, taxation is also the most sustainable uh, tobacco control measure. And I will demonstrate it shortly through a PowerPoint link of how uh, from taxation and then you can fund tobacco control programs, and then uh, as you fund tobacco control programs, and then you have reduced uh, uh, consumption, and then uh, you have public health benefits, and then you have a healthy population. So uh, taxation is the most effective uh, tobacco control measure. It is the most sustainable strategy. And then uh, thirdly, is that uh, taxation is a strategy that you are able to implement uh, consistently. Um, whereas uh, uh, smoke-free policies, uh, whereas uh, maybe uh, alternative cropping, uh, whereas uh, the other policies that includes public education 
how to some of the interventions required uh, to reduce demand. Taxation offers any government the opportunity to consistently engage uh, in the program while also raising revenue. FCTC that says that uh, governments should use tax and price policies to reduce uh, consumption. Now, why it is tax and price is that whereas governments have the power through fiscal instruments uh, to address uh, taxation, at times you have the industry absorbing tax increases and then they don't transfer them to prices. One thing that you should have in mind is that you should make tobacco products less affordable. So how do you do that? You have to uh, ensure that tax products are increased on a sustainable basis. You also have to ensure that uh, you, you have to do it repeatedly and you have to ensure that um, uh, the, 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 the more weight is given to specific uh, tax system. Shisha is a tobacco product which ingredients are unknown since they are not standardized. According to the World Health Organization, a single session of shisha is equal to 100 sticks of cigarettes. The FCTC World Health Organization tobacco smoking, uh, according to the World Health Organization, it is the number one preventable cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, and it's estimated that 2.5 million Kenyans over 18, uh, over 11.6 percent of the country's adult population currently use tobacco products. I think this one has been shared, and it's also in the guts that you you have there. And I think this one was in 2014. So three years later, we are yet to do another uh, research. Apart from our youth consuming the shisha, you'll find that due to the poor packaging and the labeling of shisha, other ingredients can be left in there. Like we have mentioned, cannabis or you know, heroin. The exact ingredients are often Okay, this one is not showing very well here. Unknown. The ingredients in shisha are always unknown due to poor labeling manufacturing method that are not standardized. So you'll find that our youths, they are going in the parties. Like my chairman says, normally, you'll find one young man with like five or six ladies. Wanaenda kutumia shisha hapo mjini. Kijana moja, vijana tano, wasichana tano, sita, saba. Then you wonder, what's happening here? You'll find most, shisha is mostly consumed by ladies. Kweli yama wongo? A recent study by the Kenya Tobacco Control Association shows that most of the shisha smokers are ladies, and this may affect their fertility rate and cause other chronic diseases which might be harmful to the health of women. Bambula so mati yo marabura muri turwa Bambila so raburi muri dala Bambunila so mati yo marabura muri turwa Bambila so mati yo raburi muri dala The World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control or the FCTC is an evidence-informed international treaty that came into force in 2005. The convention represents a milestone for the promotion of public health and provides new legal dimensions for international health cooperation. One key provision of the FCTC calls for the promotion of economically viable alternatives to tobacco. In this video, we look at one case study from Western Kenya, where a group of farmers is turning to bamboo as a potential alternative livelihood. All over the world, the FCTZ is encouraging substitution of tobacco by alternative crops and other better alternatives of livelihoods. Now, Kenya, we have started experimenting on uh, bamboo as an alternative crop. And uh, the best thing with bamboo is that uh, it doesn't require any pesticides. It doesn't require fertilizer, it doesn't require a lot of labor, and the productivity in terms of income is about four times higher than tobacco. It doesn't require child labor. It also respects the age of a farmer because tobacco does not respect the age of the farmer. 
Even if you are old every year, down the line you must be able to farm tobacco. But for bamboo, the moment you plant once for the rest of your life, you will be harvesting and getting your incomes down the line. Bamboo is a, one person can do everything because it, has got no, it has, does not involve many works to be done in the bamboo farms or in the processing of bamboo. So we can see bamboo is a, can do best than tobacco. Farmers uh, can st start bamboo. They leave tobacco because tobacco has so many diseases that they affected them. Bamboo has over 2,000 uses recorded. They are able to use it to make their own houses. They are able to use bamboo in fencing. We make toothpicks, hair clips, we make uh, sugar dishes, chairs, tables, mats. We make even a, a, a trophy. We make cups. They say tobacco is a good cash crop and is good for industry. They even said without tobacco, farmers have no alternative crops, no, no alternative livelihood, so they can, they can even die if they don't go tobacco. All these things are wrong. People are poor. They don't have an alternative cropping system for them to be able to leave tobacco and plant something else. So the industry ensures that what they have produced has ready market. And if they go to another cropping, the government needs to ensure that they also have availability of market. Since bamboo is a long-term a long term the crop. Or you, when you plant bamboo today, you wait for three or four, the fourth year to start using bamboo. Getting things to, for life to continue is very difficult. The importance of, of bamboo, uh, when I compare it with the tobacco, is that it is not health hazard. Yeah. Then uh, there are so many uses. In tobacco, you know, you can't even use its leaves for vegetables. But uh, bamboo, we use it for food. Bamboo ni lo so malungu mumi weodala. Bamboo ni lo so mumi weodala.